Hello, dear friends. We're happy to greet you once again. Today we will have a conversation with the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, in several of our videos you mentioned the circle practice. In particular, when we talked about how people can get rid of intrusive thoughts and obsessive images, and when we were looking for the tools. Back then, you said that if our viewers happen to become interested in this practice, maybe you could tell us about it someday. And you know, there is definitely a great interest. Moreover, with every new mention of this practice, the interest suddenly increases. What is the circle practice? What is its essence? And whom is it actually intended for? The spiritual path, spiritual development, generally speaking, in the world a long time ago. We won't delve into that. Someday we will tell you, if you are interested. There existed two practices, the lotus and the circle. The lotus practice is well described. Many people know it, try it and so on. And there was the practice of the circle, or the circle practice. Both names are correct. What is the difference between them? As a matter of fact, they differ in many aspects, while in their depths, in their essence, there is nothing different. Let's say, both practices lead to God, yet, if we take the lotus practice, it was actually the Shambhala trend. It was intended for chosen ones. It was sort of secret knowledge. And for a person to receive the lotus practice, he had to at least earn the trust in Belavadya. At the very least, it wasn't given to a person just like that. It's a great honor to live in the times when this practice is available to everyone. You see, it was known to everyone, even to a child. But a little bit earlier, yet later on, it so happened that there began persecution of those people. Thus, it was all eradicated. However, the lotus was at least more or less described. And how it is nowadays. And there were more profound mentions of it. Well, again, it was all superficial, even in the Quran. It is said that Muhammad himself reached the lotus of the utmost boundary and so on. This is a clear indication of which practice he himself personally performed. Well, it is understandable that, taking into account whom he communicated with, with Jibril, it is understandable that his practice was of the same level, so to say. As for the circle practice, unlike the lotus, it was given, let's say, from a teacher to a disciple. And it was really more accessible and even widely applicable. It was interesting uh, the fact that, basically, in any religion, at the initial stages of formation of a religion, I would even say, while it was not a religion, but the knowledge coming in its purity, there were followers, and people almost always started with the circle. Why? It is more accessible and more understandable for people. And there is one more phenomenon. While the lotus is intended for people who stand firm on the spiritual path and have a serious intention, the circle practice was used for people of the first and second types, according to our classification. It is for those who know. For those who do not know what people of the first and second type are, those are people of very materialistic thinking, who are largely dependent on Satan, so to say, or slaves of Satan. It is extremely difficult for them to come to any perception through feelings. It is difficult for them to understand even what love is, and so on. Therefore, such people needed help. If we take the lotus practice, after becoming familiar with it simply at the level of his own consciousness, a person gains an understanding of how to perform it, what to do, and at what stages, and he can follow this path independently, so to say. As for the circle practice, a teacher, an advisor, or the like, is needed in this case. And the role of the advisor was exactly to teach a person, to observe his own consciousness. That's the first thing to do, so that a person would understand that consciousness is not him. After all, let's be honest, nearly all of us believe that consciousness is us, 
those thoughts and images which come. Well, we already discussed this more than once, that they are ours, that it is us who think, create images, and we are consciousness in fact, right? Mm -hmm. While in this case, the entire idea was to teach a person to understand that consciousness is not him, that it is that very demon or shaitan, which a person should fear and control. He should fear that the demon would set him up. And look, there's another little nuance. I'll digress a little bit. A person was supposed to fear his consciousness. He was supposed to fear shaitan, the devil. As for God, he was supposed to love him, and not vice versa. Yet later on, it was all changed. You see how everything was easily Great. manipulated, but that's not the point. So firstly, a person should realize that consciousness is not him. Observe it and understand it all. Secondly, he should realize that he is personality, that he is exactly the one who finances with his life both primary and secondary consciousness as well as all those thought forms and images. We discussed this already. Only afterwards could a person begin an inner dialogue, so to say, right? Or he actually had to learn to love and to direct this power of love to the spiritual world until there was at least some response. And when a person already begins to receive at least a slightest response to the love that he sends to the spiritual world, meaning to the soul, just to make it clear, to his own soul. And he receives an answer from there. Only then this person could start performing the circle practice. While before that, they had been preparing him. That's where the fundamental difference is. What is another? I would say serious difference. When a person performs the circle practice, he forces what distracts him out of the circle. He creates a pair, personality and the soul, or the spiritual world, and encloses it all into the inner circle. In other words, he is sort of inside the circle, but he as it forces consciousness, all thoughts and everything that distracts him, well, the whole world, out of the circle. Clearly, in the beginning, it all takes place at the level of consciousness, at the level of imagination. That's the first stage. And later on, even at the level of perception of it all. And this circle gradually widens. The stronger this connection between personality and the soul becomes, the closer the fusion is, the bigger the circle is, and the farther the demon is from the person. Well, that's also a good method, let's say, to reject what consciousness offers. Not everything, I emphasize, but what is negative and what can harm a person, those very images and many other things. Thus, it is simpler and easier to struggle. I'll explain it this way. At the first stages, even at the level of imagination, when a person has perception of the spiritual world through feelings, when true love is generated, a person as if imagines that he is in a circle, while all those thoughts, demons, are outside the circle, and they cannot cross this line. Why? A person controls that. After all, it is much easier to control a small area, isn't it? Meanwhile, the one who practices observation of his own consciousness understands that it is boundlessness. It's a universe. Our consciousness is able to expand to embrace planets and anything else. Yes, at the level of imagination, but still, while in this case, there are precise boundaries limited by the circle, and no one can get in there as the third, only a human and the spiritual world. I mean, a human as personality. And then everything develops almost like in the lotus. That is, love intensifies and so on. While in the lotus, everything is certainly much simpler. There are no preparatory stages that may last for decades. There is no that very struggle. But you see, if a person is of the first or the second type, and he wants some specific actions, you know, he needs some tasks, he has to do something, to fight against something. So in this case, it's exactly what is needed. People of the first and second types are the prevailing majority. Yes, there are a lot of this them. This explains why the practice of the circle was more, let's say, popular or somehow among. Yes, it was both more popular and more accessible. But again, the lotus was like a secret knowledge. You said that the lotus at least had a certain description, while the practice of circle, as it turns out, was passed on. From a teacher to a disciple. But nevertheless, it was used everywhere. Even if we trace, and there are a great many factors, 
First of all, people always sat down in a circle while communicating. No one was supposed to enter the circle. These are such clear-cut rules of this teaching. Let's say, it's a whole teaching. By the way, it is very clearly described in the Hadiths, because it was also interesting for me that when the Prophet gathered together with his community, with his followers, they sat down in a circle too. At least it is described that if someone comes, do not make one person get up in order to sit another one, but sit closer, so that he sits in the circle. Or widen the circle. Yes, widen this circle. Or there was also a moment when there came… Well, these are the rules that are described, let's say, implicitly described, yes. that are present in this very technique. Why is it forbidden to stand inside a circle? After all, in Islam it is also clearly stated that Allah, through the Prophet, cursed a person who stood in the center of the circle. Why is it so? Yes, he will curse anyone who stands in the center of the circle. You know, I will draw a parallel. In our recent video we mentioned how during classes, when people are engaged in spiritual practices, group classes and so on, often there are those who draw attention to themselves. A person stands up and rambles something off the point or begins to argue to prove something completely off the topic of the conversation. What does he do that for? To attract attention. I mean, in this way, he destabilizes the whole group. For example, a group is in catharsis, self-purification is taking place, they are learning how consciousness works, what tricks from Satan they have to experience, how to get away from them, what should be stopped in time and how. But here, a person stands up and begins to ramble about whatever turns up, or even, let's say, topic-wise, but in a different direction. And this happens during almost every class, time after time. As they say, the same ugly mugs, and it really sucks, right? As a rule, someone provokes, a couple of people pick it up, and the whole group suffers because of that. In other words, the group spend their own life, their own energy, and time to prove something to those egoists who have come, not for spiritual knowledge, but in order to take the attention and the life of these people. They don't understand and don't know that. Internally, they go to spiritual classes and want something, either to familiarize themselves with something or to learn something new. But shaitan sends them precisely to take away life from those who want to gain it. You see, that is why the one who comes inside the circle attracts the attention of all the people. He focuses people on himself. Everyone involuntarily focuses on him, and he takes away their life. That is why Allah, through the Prophet Muhammad, cursed those who sat in the middle of the circle. Yet, why do people aspire so much to the center of the circle, say, to become the center of the circle? Well, people do not aspire. The consciousness must also be deceiving them somewhere about something. People do not aspire. It is consciousness that pushes them. Right. You know, a simple question, why do people dye their hair in extraordinary colors, dress provocatively, get weird tattoos, or put piercings all over themselves. Why? In order to attract attention. The system gives them some incentives, doesn't it? Of course. The more attention they receive, the more internal opiates they get, endorphins or something else. And a person is on the upswing at this time, meaning he feels great, he feels good. But as soon as he doesn't receive attention from people, he begins to have depression, excessive self-criticism, or to put it simply, the system begins to press him so that he would go and attract attention again. Everything is very simple. You know, I also remember that he once said that if a person has learned to steal a lot of attention and he suddenly finds himself in an environment where there are no people, the system will come to him anyway in order to get the same amount of attention. Definitely, but this time it will take away his. Precisely from him. Let's look at the lives of many popular people. There's another little interest. Why does magic not work? let's say, on public people who are very, very famous. It doesn't work. Presidents or some prominent performers who never go off the screens. At the moment, when they are on the screens, as long as their image and name are known to a huge number of people, and a huge number of people evoke in themselves those phantom images, magic doesn't work on them. Well, it will work, but Imagine what kind of power one should have to overpower. The system itself protects them, doesn't it? Of course, to overpower the resistance, the very protection of the system itself, you see? I mean, this is beneficial and interesting for the system. It's a source of its income. Let's say, it is nourishment of the system itself. Masses of people spend their time, life, and invest their attention in this person's image. 
Can you imagine? Of course the system will protect its assets. But let's see what often happens to those people after they lose, let's say, the platform where they can get that attention from people, okay? That's where the same thing begins to happen stereotypically to almost all of them, with rare exceptions. When a person has drastically changed his or her way of life, realized something, overcome it, and lives on, or a person, let's say, has another platform for getting attention, he has something to pay the system with, then still… Otherwise, it devours him, doesn't it? Otherwise, it simply devours him. I'm just saying, anyone and everyone can trace it all. Igor Mikhailovich, but if we summarize the circle practice, it has stages. Firstly, a person realizes that he is not consciousness, secondly, he realizes that he is personality, and thirdly, he comes into contact with, creates a pair That's with right. his or her soul, so to speak, this very point, right? What else is interesting is that one can come out of the circle. I mean, the circle practice right. is depicted by a sign of a point inside a circle, you see? In other words, it's a single entity, the two become one. When the merging of personality with the soul takes place, a person becomes an angel, that is, a point. And after becoming an angel and gaining life eternal, a person leaves the circle. He can come out of it. Such people were described as the one who came out of the circle, right? Yes, in particular, al halaj said about the Prophet that he was Haramia, the one who came out of the circle. He came out of the circle, yes. But again, if we take the Prophet Muhammad, still, he practiced lotus, but he gave the circle practice to his disciples. There is a confirmation of that too. And there was a very serious struggle against it later on. Well, let's say, that's already a topic for a separate video. But if we talk about the first stage, to understand that you are not consciousness, how can an ordinary person, what tools does he have during the day to understand that he is not consciousness? Well, this is for skeptics, for those who believe in neither God nor anyone else, or on the contrary, for fanatics. You know, there are very dumb people, there's no other way to put it. I'm sorry, friends, I don't want to offend anyone. But there are people who are so dumb that they become fanatics of one or another religion. Well, who is a fanatic? A fanatic is a zombie, in the literal sense of the word. Except for what he has been told, nothing exists. How come it doesn't exist? If a person follows the spiritual path, he absorbs into himself everything living, like a sponge. Isn't that true? Yes, he seeks where this very life is. Sure, of course. This is normal, it's a natural state. But if a person is… Is that all? I'll do what I've been told. Pray that many times, some prayers, some rituals, and this will lead me to life. Naturally, this person will never come anywhere. These are people deceived by the system itself, and again, by religious institutions. So, for both atheists and fanatics, I would recommend to perform a simple practice, let's call it so, to allocate five minutes of their time at least twice a day. If you are somewhere at work or in transport, unless you are driving, my friend, if you have five or ten minutes, just practice. The only thing is that you need to observe your consciousness several times a day systematically. You don't need anything else. Start observing what thoughts come to you, what is going on in your mind, what desires are there. Don't produce anything by yourselves. Don't exert yourselves, just observe in a detached manner. Some people will say, you can fall asleep that way if you don't observe anything. No, you won't fall asleep, my friend. You still invest interest in the observation process, but you yourself do not contribute to the emergence of any thought. You do not support any thought. You simply sort of detach yourself from your thoughts and observe what's going on. You can close your eyes and sit comfortably, if it is comfortable for you that way, so that nothing distracts you. Mm -hmm. Thus, if you perform even this simple practice after a short period of time, whether you like it or not, you will come to realize that you pay for all this mess in your head, but you do not order it, and you yourself have no influence on it. And sometimes it is extremely difficult to get away from these thoughts. It is extremely difficult to hold your attention in neutrality. You will slip into one or another thought anyway, and it will hook you. So at this point, even through such simple practices, people come to understand that they are manipulated. They are pulled into one or another image or problem. 
and are forced to discuss it, while, in fact, in 90% of cases, or even more, this has nothing to do with your real life here today, you see? I mean, it's all fantasies and off the point. There is also the following question, Ingrid Mikhailovich. Many people are afraid even to come in touch with the experience of spiritual practices because they are afraid to lose their individuality. And you said that the second stage is that a person should understand who he is, that he is as personality. That he is personality, of course. The issue of individuality. I just very well remember you telling us how many times a day A person is not himself because there is primary consciousness, there is secondary consciousness, there is this reptilian brain, and there is a human as personality. Who are you every minute during the day? Tatiana, wait, let's consider that there is a whole legion of selves in secondary consciousness, for it forms so many varieties of one and the same person. Of actors. Of course, as you say, actors. And they impose this role on personality. And a human as personality identifies oneself with this actor, with this image that is imposed on him. He doesn't understand. Somewhere he feels, somewhere he understands that something is wrong. But nevertheless, the system itself burdens him with problems so much that he simply doesn't live. He exists. He's like a bio-machine which executes one or another thing, you see? And here? Consciousness itself is already as a programmer. It just overwhelms a person with problems. Isn't that true? My friends, observe yourselves, for it is true. And you are saying, how many times a day? I'll put it simpler. Their entire lives, people live this way, even without suspecting that they aren't this, let's say, product of the system, which has been imposed on them. Well, these are really imposed habits, character, and everything else. It is absolutely imposed. And due to these stereotypes, which the system imposes on a person, it easily manipulates him, you see? Everyone has their own string. I would compare this to, you know, there's a doll with tied strings to its foot and hand. The system pulls them, and that's our character. Those are our habits, again, literally, like this doll. We become easily controlled by the system itself. In order for a human to become free, and indeed, only through love, one can gain life eternal. Say, only a free human can produce love qualitatively and so deeply as to receive a response, that is, to restore a dialogue with the spiritual world. After all, the devil will not allow him to do that. And here everything is very simple, in fact. A person must get rid of slavery get away from Satan and take the side of God. This is the only way to gain life. There is simply no other way. Therefore, there were practices that helped. You see, there's a quick and good way. It is the lotus. And there is a practice for people who find it hard to understand that there is even the spiritual world, who find it hard to understand that they are not consciousness that consciousness is not their tool. You once told us that the lotus practice is pure because there are no images there in it. There is nothing in it. You cannot build magic in it. No. You cannot build anything on it. While the circle practice is suitable for people, let's say, of the first type, who are closer to magic, yes. to the bond with consciousness, to magic. So, there is the following question. It turns out that there are images in the circle practice. Certainly, there are. And there is a risk that this practice may be distorted. There is. Indeed, in the circle practice, a person can much quicker turn towards magic. In other words, he is more vulnerable. But again, all this depends on a person, how firmly he stands, how much he really struggles. Because you should also understand that when you resist the system, you don't delve into love. Like in the lotus, you just resist. And through this resistance, you also produce love, but sort of driving those demons away from yourself and creating a circle. Firstly, you see them. Secondly, you are distracted. Thirdly, you resist. You keep the purity of this circle. Plus, you should generate love and send it to the spiritual world, right? So look at how busy you are. Tusks. Yes, such kind of multitasking. And again, due to a close cooperation with, let's say, the system itself at the first stage, this often leads to the awakening of magical abilities in people. Or the system finds a weak spot and just draws a person out of the circle. Such things also happen. Igor Mikhailovich, almost every religion has a reference to the circle. Right. I mean, 
There happen to be different variations of this. Well, I don't know. Not almost every, but every religion, I would say. Everyone. Why? Because the knowledge that was given, that was brought by the prophets, is simple. And naturally, there were only two practices, either the lotus, excuse me, or the circle. The circle was given to masses of people, and everything basically starts with it. Namely, the spiritual path does, while the lotus is for the chosen ones. That's how it was distributed for some reason. Although, friends, to be honest, in my opinion, the lotus is the lotus. You don't have to fight with anyone there. You… Well, if you really aspire to the spiritual world, if you really feel and love God, then the lotus practice is ideal. But again, if a person is full of complexes, in this case, the circle should definitely be used, or even in order to simply explain to a person how he can enter. Let's say, those altered states in general, as some people say, at least a little bit break away from consciousness, learn at least something, let it be some meditative practices or not to mention the spiritual ones. Of course, he needs some simple and understandable tool. But it is interesting that if we take that very Sufism, then it turns out that they probably started from the circle practice, because there is this practice of whirling, Certainly. the meditative practice yes. of whirling, and there are a lot of that very Ahaj who said that the Prophet is Haramia who came out of the circle. He very clearly describes, I read it while preparing for our conversation, he very clearly describes a circle with a point. Right. He writes that there is a point in the center of the circle. This is a pair. And he says that this point is the truth. Yes, basically in Christianity it is also said, and we mentioned this in one of the videos in the Circle of Life video, that there was Abba Dorotheus, who said that the center is God Himself. Yes. Right, and the fact that… Whom a human being aspires to, yes. Right. Again, why does it denote God, and why does it denote a human who has attained fusion, meaning oneness? Saints aspire to the center of the circle. That's how they described it in Christianity. Right. So, the circle practice left a mark in all religions. Let's put it simply, in Christianity, it is the rituals of walking around buildings, right? In Islam, what do they do when performing Hajj? It seems that religions are different, but why do everyone perform this walking in a circle? Because God is one, you see? I'll put it simply. Religions differ only in wallets of masters of religions. Excuse me, friends, but it's true. Everything else is exactly the same. God is one. God's love is one. And there are two ways to attain it. Well, the third way is when a person does it spontaneously. Such things also happen, right? But anyway, no matter how you twist it, can a person attain it simply through prayer practices, I don't know, through just producing love and without the lotus practice? Without anything, he can. It is harder, it is more difficult. But when the way is defined and when he really loves God, he will come to him anyway, right? Igor Mikhailovich, and what if we now touch upon the subject of ritual as walking around shrines, altars and temples? All religions always began as teachings. They all began with clockwise walking. Right. And it couldn't have been otherwise. It is just when the interest changed from the spiritual to the material. When there appeared, let's say, a master in a community, who was interested in turning a free society that followed the spiritual path into a religion, creating slaves and subordinates. Let's call things by their proper names, right? Why? When a person craves after power, he usurps it. Let's suppose in a religious community, and that's it, the teaching becomes a religion, then everything immediately changes, and people start going in a different direction. He leads them in a different direction. Let's put it simply. There was the Prophet Muhammad, who clearly commanded to follow in his footsteps, right? To do what he did. He warned that there would be those who would immediately begin to distort the teaching he had brought. Well, our friends, Muslims, will either confirm my words or they may refute them if it is not true. How did the Prophet Muhammad walk while performing Hajj? The same way as those who did it before him, clockwise. That's right. 
But later on, there was such a caliph as Umar, who forced the entire Ummah to walk in the other direction, against the Prophet himself. I won't go into details if people are interested. We can make a video on this subject and discuss why, what happened, and how. You know, I would ask a question to those who have a mind and enjoy comparing, so to say, looking for the truth. Friends, answer the question, please. What do the Caliph Umar and the so-called Apostle Paul have in common? I mean, Caliph Umar in Islam and Paul in Christianity. Take information, study it, only study it thoroughly, and you yourselves will see the whole essence of why people went in the other direction. Since time immemorial, there has been an understanding. Yes, there was ritual walking, but it has nothing to do with spirituality, in fact. Practice is practice. And there were dynamic practices too. You've just mentioned Sufis. Welling. It's a dynamic practice. So in order to make it clear, the first Sufis spend clockwise. As soon as it became a branch of religion, they started spinning in the other direction. Uh -huh. Some people also had their own interest in that. Yes, they also started as equals, but then a hierarchy was built. They started as equals. Why did they actually retreat? A simple question, why did they separate and retreat to the desert precisely when Caliph Umar, let's put it carefully… He compiled the Qur'an into one text. Yes, he compiled the Qur'an into one text. Those people didn't accept a lot of things because they remembered the Prophet. They honored and loved him. So they retreated. Well, those were really smart people. They preserved love for Allah and devotion to the Prophet Muhammad. Their community was considered a little bit crazy. Yes, sort of strange, weird fellows. Let's call things by their proper names. They behaved sort of strangely. They didn't recognize any manuscripts. They conveyed the knowledge from one person to another, and their knowledge was based on the circle practice. That's what is interesting about it. And again, they performed dynamic meditations, dynamic meditation, when they whirl. Yes. It brings a person exactly to a point where he begins to feel as personality. There is a distinct separation. In other words, a person feels primary and secondary consciousness and feels himself as personality. Thus, everything sort of falls in its place. Well, you know, I don't recommend it. It's not to everyone's taste. A person whose vestibular apparatus is really good enough can practice this as well. So, what's the point of that ritual walking? There was a holy place, okay? Or let's take it as an image of a holy place, so to say. And people walked around it. It was a symbolic movement. Which side do people turn towards the spiritual? The right side. Why? Because in all religions, it has always been said, on your right side there is an angel, and on your left side there is a devil. So, you turn with the angel, with what is holy towards what is holy. You revere it. Right. Later on, performance of magic rites, commemoration of the dead. Warfare magic, exactly. Warfare magic. It was all done over the left shoulder. That is, everything went against the flow. Isn't that true? Yes, exactly. That's the answer. Let's take a simple example. We don't even have to go far. We take Orthodox Christianity. In Orthodox Christianity, until recent times, let's say. Well, yes, the 17th century. Right, they walked clockwise. Patriarch Nikon. Exactly, Patriarch Nikon, the revolutionary who introduced a church reform. That's right. He forced everyone to walk not clockwise, but counterclockwise. What did this patriarch really want? What did he strive for? He strove to conquer Istanbul. Didn't he? Yes, he had a political motive, together with Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich. Of course, Nikon wanted to become not an ordinary patriarch, but the ecumenical one, basically the holiest, the richest, and the most powerful. That's what he strove for. And when the Greeks also explained to him what was the meaning of it all, he immediately changed everything, didn't he? It's just that at that time there was such a great resistance from people, the old believers. New literature was brought from Venice and Florence about how those religious services should be held, but people compared and realized that no. Of course, there were substitutions. This literature wasn't needed, and there was such severe persecution against them, with brutal, very brutal tortures. They were killed, tortured and killed. 
So, my friends, just imagine a religious organization that takes care of the soul and is supposed to lead to love, and this is actually based on the teaching of Jesus Christ where he said, if they slap you on the left cheek, turn the right one to them. His teaching was based on peacefulness yes. and denial of everything evil and bad. And he was an example, right? When people tortured and crucified him, he preserved them. He didn't to destroy them. He showed patience and indiscriminate forgiveness. Yet, those followers destroyed each other merely for ritualism or for performing some actions in one or another way. Why? For the sake of plain symbolism. It is not plain symbolism, it is magic, real magic. You yourself have just said warfare magic, yes. other magic. Yes. Here's a simple example. When people go clockwise, mm -hmm. they are spiritually evolving from the inside out. Mm -hmm. But when they go counterclockwise, it is, pardon me, veneration of death. From the outside inwards, isn't it? Well, it might seem that if we take the spiritual, it should be inwards and so on. But this relates to the material universe. My friends, everything is different in this case. Let me give you a simple example for understanding. Let's take an elementary particle. As long as it is in the state of a particle, mm -hmm. its spin or rotation is counterclockwise. As soon as it switches to the state of a wave or energy, its spin becomes clockwise, meaning its rotation is clockwise. It immediately changes. Here's a simple answer for you, my friends. Think about what the point is. And didn't they know about it in the past? They knew that, you see, because they paid a lot of attention to it and killed people for that. Those who resisted and proved that Jesus Christ did this way, or Prophet Muhammad did this way, and how many people were killed? Excuse me. As soon as the Prophet Muhammad had left, what started? Even towards his near and dear ones, what did those people who were close to him do? Why? In order to strengthen faith, to strengthen faith or to establish religion, a controlled and pliant one, with chaos. So whom did they serve, Allah or Shaitan? That's the answer, you see. The most interesting thing is that the Prophet really knew about what was going to happen. He foresaw it all and spoke about it. He even warned his daughter, Fatima, that it was going to happen. Igor Mikhailovich, why did he, let's say, knowing that there were certain people in his circle who were going to distort the truth, just like Jesus? The Prophet saw everything very well and understood the essence of everyone perfectly well. He did call things by their proper and names. And called things by their proper names. Yes. But why didn't he sort of prevent that? Why didn't he expel yes, them? Yes, why didn't he expel those people? He didn't expel those who would later on alter the teaching. Yes. Who would trade his name, right? Mm -hmm who would kill his true disciples afterwards. After all, they knew, Jesus knew, and Prophet Muhammad knew. But they didn't do that. And many people may come with such a question, how come? All the more, when they knew, they could have got rid of them, and that's all. Yes, that's logical. My friends, there is a certain law, the one they knew about. For example, there is a group, and in the group there is always a conductor. In other words, there is one whom the system presses most of all. One percent. A weak link, even one person. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus had expelled, let's suppose, that very Peter, Paul was nowhere near him, had expelled that very Peter, and the Prophet Muhammad expelled that very Umar, others would have appeared. The system would do everything to enslave someone among others close to them. So, knowing and understanding this, they simply turned a blind eye to it. In what sense did they turn a blind eye? How many times did the Prophet scold Umar in public, in front of everyone? How many times did Jesus Christ scold Peter? He called him, excuse me, a stone. Cephas is a Cephas. And then all of a sudden he became Peter, right? Yes, the one who doubts. Right. Well, let's look who has built a religion. In fact, that very Mary, excuse me, this, I mean, Mary Magdalene, she is the love of Christ. She is the one who loved Christ Himself, and Christ loved her. 
and she was called a prostitute and a whore. A harlot. After all, Peter was the first who started that. Only recently this was abolished, but people don't even know that it was abolished. It was actively promoted, but afterwards it was abolished. It was done already after 2,000 years, so to say. Yes, this is engraved in consciousness anyway. But why? She posed a great threat for them. Certainly, of course. So it turns out that God's messengers let the situation go as it was because they knew that those people were already doomed, right? That in the spiritual aspect, those people were already in order to protect others. They understood perfectly well how the system works. They knew the games of shaitan. You are saying it right, to protect others, because there were people who didn't serve shaitan, who escaped his clutches, Well, there were those who played with him, do you understand? They tried to wear two hats. They came to the Great Ones for magic. It's actually obvious. And the Great Ones knew that. They knew that if they expelled that one out, the system would put pressure and take the life of one of the good people. Wow. Everything is very simple. And both of them knew that the teaching of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad were doomed to become religions. And both of them talked about it. The Prophet Muhammad even talked about it openly. This is actually known. But nevertheless, the Prophet Muhammad made a very profound and serious groundwork for the future. He exactly counted on the fact that it wasn't for those who lived at that time, yes, surely. but for those who will be living at the end of times. In other words, even today so many people feel that it was written as if directly for them nowadays, for those who live at this time. Right, because he came in order to prepare people, so that despite all the resistance from shaitan, there would remain those grains, the grains of truth, that could bring up among the entire Ummah the genuine true followers of Muhammad himself, who would be devoted to Allah, who, at the end of times, would come to the aid of the one whom the Prophet Muhammad spoke about. It would help to preserve this world, to keep it, so that all of humanity would survive. For the sake of preservation of the entire humanity, the Prophet actually did his best. As it is said, not for the sake of educating someone, but for the sake of saving all of us. He came for all of us. Didn't he speak about that? He did. But later on, everything drastically changed. You see how? Well, this is life. That's normal. Oh, Igor Mikhailovich, what an interesting new topic is unfolding, the one you've just raised. Why is it new? It's not new, it's the truth of life. Is this really not known? Yet why is it not discussed? I wonder. Again, look, there are almost two billion people in Islam, but why don't they discuss it? Why don't they tell the truth? Why don't they say that many hadiths were exactly presented by those who betrayed the Prophet himself, who acted in the interests of the religious organization and not in the interest of Muslims, those for whose sake the Prophet himself came. Why is it that those hadiths were made up by that person? People do know who made them up. They know what he made up and how to counter that. Why do people not talk about it? Why haven't they themselves purified their religion to this day? As a matter of fact, this is faith, you know? This is how to understand what faith is. Well, in my understanding, I may be mistaken. Friends, correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me that I'm mistaken, and we will think, maybe it's true. But in my understanding, if a person embarks on the spiritual path, he must come to God, definitely. Otherwise, why embark on it? Serve the devil calmly. You'll be a sub-personality. However, if you serve the devil, honestly, frankly and devotedly, if you possess outstanding energy and do not care about anyone, you are such a slave of Satan, then he will create better conditions for you than for others. Not for long, though. Afterwards, you will pay for everything, but it will be afterwards. As a matter of fact, Satan's slaves are not used to living now. They think about afterwards. Satan's slaves always expect that they will live afterwards. That's how consciousness deceives them, while those who really advance to the spiritual world think not only about afterwards, but they begin to live now. It is interesting that in that very Islam, when they talked about believers and those who were sinners, they also mentioned the circle. They used to say that the one who has sinned 
let's say, has stolen something or committed adultery, goes from the small circle to the big circle. Right. The small circle was called Iman, it is faith, yes. while the big circle is Islam, meaning as a religion. That's right. But you can leave the big circle only conventionally speaking when you're a polytheist, that you… Right. When you went to serve Satan, yes, exactly. but as long as you do not serve Satan, well, you have sinned. You get out of the small circle into the big circle. That's the way it is. So you stay within this community of friends, so to speak. Again, of course, all this was actually described and recounted. It was verbally described and recounted in the teaching of the circle. You know, it is also interesting that we all know expressions such as, this person is right. He is the right person, sure. a righteous person. Yes. Meanwhile, there are leftward people. Who are leftward people? They are left out, those who have nothing to do with us, right? Yes. Again. Left-wing views, right-wing views. Yes, a rightward movement and a leftward movement. Well, here there is a lot to elaborate on. Basically, everyone knows this. Everyone has seen and encountered it. It's just that they haven't thought about it. But the understanding and knowledge of it has been preserved. I have a different question. Why is it extremely difficult to find descriptions of it nowadays? After all, look. For example, the circle practice was performed until the year 1200 for sure, by the true followers of Christ, I mean Cathars, and others like them, until they were exterminated. But they specifically performed this practice. They didn't have folly or stupidity. Again, all of them sat down in a circle and communicated. In fact, both Jesus and the Prophet had a dialogue. When did the monologue begin? When religions were formed. When religion was established and knowledge was killed. Well, not killed, but distorted and already converted into a material, sort of profitable material part. And that's it, the monologue began. An actor is on the stage, others are in the audience, and they listen and obey. Yet, I'll say again, both in the Prophet's time and in the time of Jesus Christ, everyone was equal, because the circle makes people equal, right? Right. And there were conversations. There were no homilies of some kind or something else, you know? Or again, it is stupidity. You and I already discussed it in one of the recent videos. When people hold the same literature in their hands, read the same pages, there is an actor on the stage, and excuse me, slaves in the audience. Read at home. Why have you come? To read? It is interesting to come, to share experiences and to learn something interesting, right? But when, what is there to share? You know, an empty thing will not teach you anything. There is no internal, there is nothing to share. For this very reason, rules have been elaborated. People gather, and most importantly, what do they gather for? To pay taxes, you know, to share their income. In Islam, who has introduced the tax? I mean, collection of funds. This was not the case in the Prophet's time. This is, again… We already mentioned this name today. Yes, the same odious personality. And who introduced that in Christianity? Again. The same odious personality, right? I mean, the Christian one. I guess we already start answering your question addressed to viewers. You are right. Let people find it themselves. Compare. Yes, and compare, if they are interested. If they really want to know the truth, if they really strive for something, at least for knowledge, you know, how and what actually happened in reality and why. Because until you see it for yourself, until you discover it yourself, you won't understand. If you are really interested in something and not just passing the time, right? Mm -hmm. What is also interesting is that al Halaj, when describing the circle, the practice of the circle, he said that the circle itself is not manifested and you can recognize it by the fragrance it emits. Of course. And if it were not for the fragrance from the circle, the caravan that goes to the circle would not recognize it that there is no door through which you could get there, but only through the point in the center of the circle. Through love. Which is the truth, through love. Right, because you create from the inside out. Mm -hmm. When a pair is created, mm -hmm. personality and the soul, the circle goes from the inside out. That is why you can create it precisely when you have the power. And the power is given to you only when the spiritual world gives you its love. Your own power won't be enough for you to resist Satan. That's what this very teaching of the circle was based on.
It is very important that this pair with the beloved should be created, because otherwise it's a loop circle, meaning you constantly… A lot of people try, how can I get rid of all these obsessive thoughts and images? The practice of the circle actually helps When the that. understanding of the soul of the pair is removed, of then you kind of walk in a loop circle, in the circle of the samsara wheel, right, which you cannot well, escape from. Well, in that case, yes, that answers a lot, too. It is also very interesting, so as to escape from the samsara wheel, and so on. Well, basically, it is all one and the same it's thing. Just that Friends, everything is very simple. You know, we expressed it in a somewhat sketchy, superficial way, just to explain to you specifics. What is what? And what follows what? What the difference between, let's say, the practice of the circle and the lotus is. As we had promised, superficially, in the literal sense of the word, just to explain the difference between the two practices, the essence is the same. To come to the spiritual world, Let's put it simply, one is finite, while the other one never ends. I mean, the lotus. It's impossible to reach the boundary of the lotus. You also said that a teacher was the one who brought a disciple to the circle. Yes, of course. While from there you go on your and road. And from there, a person walked on his God own. God is already a teacher. For a teacher cannot enter the circle. That's the point. Yes. There is already God in you in the circle, and that's all. Therefore, we will say it again, that the practice of the circle began only when there was a response to the love sent by Personality. It's just that in Christianity it is also mentioned that when you go, God comes to meet you. That's right. And then, when you love, you are constantly looking at the loving one, and the more you look, the more you love, and so this looped circle is formed. A looped circle. This becomes looped. So again, everything goes again to the practice of the circle, and again returns to it. Well. It's an interesting topic. Actually, let's say, if our friends have any questions, we will talk and explain, if the questions are worth it. Worth it. Excuse me. But far and wide they ask questions. I understand that it is interesting, but those questions are from the mind, right? Yes, that also happens. Definitely, you know. If you spend your life, then spend it so that someone else would gain life, right? That's what the true purpose and mission in the life of every person should be. Of course, certainly. But to answer questions from the mind, you know, why is a mountain thin at the top and wide at the bottom? Well, this is ridiculous. So, friends, let's cherish each other's lives, take care of each other, and let's start with a simple thing. Let's just love each other. Thank you very much, Igor Mikhailovich, for such a meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, friends. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.